All right, hello, my name is John Al, and I work with the Mississippi State Extension Service in the Forestry Department, and we're here doing this Managing the Family Forest video, and I have a certain couple of sections that I want to talk to you about. The, fir the first is going to be working with loggers, and the second is going to be best management practices for water quality. I am the coordinator for what we call the PLM program, or the, or the Professional Logging Manager Program, which means that I run the training program for the lo all the loggers within the state. And I've had the opportunity and the pleasure of working with most of those loggers for the past 16 years. All right, first thing we want to talk about is the fact that a harvest is actually a silvicultural tool. And by that, what we mean is that it's important for the future forest stand what kind of harvest you want to have. And, and a lot of times, like forestry and a lot of other, pr or other professions have basically their own terminology. We want to make you familiar with some of those terms and let you know what those are so you can make a better informed decision about what, what to do with your forest land. And again, like I said, the harvest is determined by the future stand. So whatever your objectives are, whether you want to plant another stand completely where we want to clear cut, or you want to keep that stand and just manage it, that would be more of a thinning. So we're going to co cover some of those top topics. And again, th these things are based on your objectives solely for your landowner. You shouldn't have anybody else tell you what to do with your land if you don't want it done. So if you want wildlife and you want all these other benefits from the forest, we need to know that ahead of time before we start the harvest. But also, it's a, it's a business decision, and don't forget that either. Anything you do in your forest is hopefully going to get you money in the long run on some level, whether it's hunting leases or it's harvest revenues, whatever those are, it's a business decision. So if it's a smart business decision, then we want to go ahead with it. If it's a bad business decision, then maybe you want to wait. So we're going to cover those topics as well. First and foremost, the, on, the, the one thing you have to consider is communication. You don't, you don't want either a forester or a logger to come in there and tell you what to do and just go ahead and do it. You want to communicate. You need to understand what's going on and what's going to happen to your forest after that harvest. And contrary to popular belief, most, a large majority of the loggers in the state of Mississippi are honest businessmen and want to do a good job for you. And, and it, it's important because a lot of people have a bad opinion of loggers when they're not. They're very good, sharp businessmen. A lot of these guys have, you know, a million dollars worth of equipment invested in their million dollars invested in their equipment and they need to make sound business decisions. And forestry and logging are word of mouth businesses. So if they do a bad job for one person in your county, they're never going to work in that county again because landowners talk to each other, foresters talk to each other. So it, it, it helps them to do the best job possible. And they can only do that if they meet your requirements, which means you have to communicate with the landowner or, or with the logger or the forester, depending on how you work that, that uh, contract out. And speaking of contracts, you should always use a contract. No matter whether you're contracting with a forester to take care of the logging for you or with the logger themselves, have a written contract. That is crucial. It's going to protect you not only in terms of what you want done with that forest, but in terms of liability for whatever happens on that logging job. Most of the problems associated with logging can be solved by communication because th there are a lot of folks out there who don't understand what the, what the logger or the forester means when they say certain things, and they just kind of assume they know what it means. They, they just kind of assume they understand when in actuality what actually happens on the ground they don't like because they, w they weren't familiar with the terminology. And we're going to cover just a few of those things. First of all is, is a kind of common term. You're going to hear this referred to several different ways. And you need to know they're all the same thing. A landing, a set, or a ramp. If a logger or a forester says, okay, we need two ramps on your property because it's 45 acres or whatever, whatever it is, that just means they need a space large enough with no trees in it to set up their loader so they can load the truck so they can get the get the material to the mill. And that's going to change depending on what you want done. Obviously, if, you, if you're in a, in a situation where you're cutting down all the trees, then it really doesn't matter where the landing is going to be because all the trees are going to be gone. If it's in a place where you're thinning and you want to manage that, that, that same stand for future benefits or for wildlife, you want to place those in strategic locations. And the forester and the logger can help you with that. Probably the most misunderstood is term that we use is a clear cut. And you can see by the slide up there that a clear cut is actually means all merchantable timber. They're going to leave stuff they can't sell standing, so it ends up looking like that. A different term, which would be clean cut, which a lot of folks really aren't that familiar with yet, but you can, you can have this in your contract. Say, I want everything cut down. It may cost you a little bit more money, but that way it leaves it a little bit more aesthetically pleasing at the end of the harvest because all those trees that couldn't be sold are then knocked down to the ground. And a thinning is just that, they're thinning. What, what you do with the thinning is if you have a pine stand or a hardwood stand, you look at the basal area of that stand, 
and you can tell that it's getting too dense or there's too many trees per acre, say. That's a good way to look at it. And what we're doing with the thinning is that we're removing some of those trees and what that does reallocates the growth to the trees that are remaining and, and allows them to grow larger and more efficiently on the space allocated for that. And so w we, we talk about it in terms of basal area, especially with pine. And so if your pine stand is 14, 15 years old and you're at 100, 120 square feet of basal area, when we thin it, we want to bring it down to anywhere between 65 and 75 square feet, typically. That's just numbers thrown around. You need to understand that's just a measure of density. The more trees per acre that you have, the, the higher that basal area number is going to be. And we, want it, we, we want it down somewhere where it's going to be the optimal to allocate growth to the remaining trees. And so when we thin, that's what we're doing. We're bringing it down to a basal area target. And there's other portions of the video that I'll explain to you more in depth what basal area is and how it's going to affect your future stand. Other forms of communication is you need to be able to express your expectations to that forester or that logger, depending on who you're contracting with. Again, tell them exactly what you want, and it's, up to, it's their job to make sure that they're fulfilling your expectations. You need to be able to tell them how to enter and leave your property. It may not always be the same way. Sometimes you can get, have trucks enter on a certain side of the property, but they have to leave a different way to get to a different road. You want to tell them any places that need to be avoided on your property. You, you could have your grandmother's cabin site or whatever, or, or it could be a, a wet area you want to preserve. Anything that you want to preserve is fine. Just make sure that they know about it and it's on the map. And all of this stuff should be listed in the contract. You want it written down where everybody's where everybody has signed and agreed to it. That way there's no misunderstanding about what should happen during that logging job. And again, logging is a business, and 99% of those loggers are honest, hardworking people. They rely on this for their livelihoods, so they want to do a good job for you. And again, it's a, it is a word-of-mouth business. So, so the better job they do for you, the better recommendation they're going to have for other landowners in your area. Because landowners should be talking together at their county forestry association meeting or something along those lines, or just as neighbors, and say, hey, did, did XYZ logging do a good job for me? You're going to say, yeah, they did. Uh, well, you know, why don't you consider using them for your, for your operation? And so that's how, that's how it typically works. So, first of all, we need to determine who you're contracting with in these relationships. If you have a, if you have a forester, a consulting forester that's going to handle this for you, then you are one step removed from that logging job. You need to decide, am I going to consult with a forester or am I going to consult directly with a logger? What is going to be the best business decision I can make? It really doesn't matter one way or the other what you do, but a lot of times if, you, if you're completely new to forestry, a forester may be the way to go because he, he can then sit down, see what you have to begin with, and help you make those decisions on, on, on how to reach your own objectives. And the other part of, of this business relationship is how do I protect myself? And the only way you really protect yourself is through this contract. So we're going to talk just a little bit more about contracts in the next few slides. <coughs> There's basically two types of contracts that, that you're going to be dealing with. One is a sales contract, and that's a transfer of the title that pe people call it a timber deed. I'm going to sell the timber deed, which means you are selling all the timber on that property to that person. The other is a service contract, what we call usually cut and haul, which means that you're just contracting for a service. A forester would fall under the service contract definition as well because you're contracting his services. You're not selling him a deed. So again, selling timber rights would be a sales contract. You're actually selling, it's a real estate transaction. Selling the product is not a real estate transaction, therefore it's a service contract. I know these get a little bit more complicated, but you can see this in the, in the Managing the Family Forest book. Some examples of a, a timber deed, selling timber rights, you could sell it to an independent timber buyer. People will come around and say, okay, we want to buy, you know, buy this stand of timber, and they're going to they're, they're do all the marketing themselves. You can sell it directly to a mill. A forester for a mill can come buy, the, buy this tract, or you can sell it directly to a logger. One is not necessarily better than the other. I don't mean to imply that one you should do one over the other, but they're all equal. In selling timber rights, you've got to remember that the buyer purchased the rights to enter your property and exercise his rights to the timber. And most often in contracts, you'll get like a year, 12 months, 12 months is very common, you'll get a year for them to exercise those rights because of certain weather conditions and market conditions. You don't, want to, you don't want to force them into one spot that's two weeks long to cut your timber. That, that just, it's not going to happen. So you have to give them a year to get in and out of your property, around a year. 
Again, selling the product, we, we refer to as a service contract. You retain ownership of that timber all the way through until it gets to the mill. And this is contract from logger to cut and haul. We call it a cut and haul contract. Again, you retain the rights, and you're just all he's doing. All that logger is doing is performing a service. We also call it cutting on shares, which means that the logger will cutting on yeah cutting on shares means that the logger takes that timber, takes it to the mill, and for every truck that crosses the scale, he's going to get a check, and you're going to get a part of that check. And you guys, you guys agree to what that proportion is going to be, 50-50, 60-40, whatever that ends up being, that's called cutting on shares. And so every week you should get a settlement from that logger after he gets his settlement from the mill. A service contract is also contracting with a consultant. So if I contract with a consultant to come do an inventory, tell me what I have, I'm going to pay him probably on a per acre basis. If I've got 100 acres, I'm going to pay him $7 an acre. It's going to, you know, it's going to be $700. Don't quote these numbers. These aren't these are just these are just examples, but it's, it's going to be $700 for him to perform that service for you, and it's the same same deal with the logger. Selling the product, you have a little bit more control, but it's limited. And one thing you have to remember about any time you have a contractor on your property is you want to have you want to maintain that what we call the independent contractor status. This person is independent independent of you, and how you protect yourself from liability is ensuring that this remains an independent business from you. You can get into a situation where you are, in fact, acting as their boss and the courts can see it that way. And, and in the case of a liability issue, say somebody gets hurt on a logging job on your property, if it's been found that you're actually controlling that business, you're the one that's going to be held liable. So you, you can help reduce liability exposure by identifying in the contract that the service is provided by an independent contractor, whether you're dealing with a logger or a forester. You want to make sure in that contract says this person is an independent contractor. But more importantly, you need to act that way. Actions trump this clause in court. And so even though I've got that independent contractor clause in my contract, if I exert too much control over that logging operation, I can be seen as their employer. So you need to be careful of that. Basically, for a contract to be legal, you need to have three things. Consideration, an agreement, and a legal right to enter into a contract. Consideration is nothing more than I'm gonna, they're going to pay you X number of dollars for every ton of wood. That's consideration. Money is a consideration. An agreement is a written formal agreement. You should not be in any position to have a verbal contract on anything you do with forestry. Everything should be written down. There's an old saying that a verbal contract's not worth the paper it's written on, and you need to understand that. You can't do business anymore in a handshake. There are too many liability issues involved nowadays. And the third thing you need for a legal contract is the legal right to enter into a contract. And so, <coughs> obviously, you cannot, con you cannot contract with somebody's employee because they don't have a legal right for that business to enter into a contract for that business. The same can be said for you. You have to have, a, you have, to have clear rights to all the timber on your property. And this, gets, this, this can get a little sticky in the case of inheritance. Because if you inherited that 500 acres and you've got three or four brothers and sisters, all of them, if they all inherited equally, they all have to sign off on that contract or, they, or you don't have a clear legal right to enter into it. So you need to make sure that, that all parties that have a legal claim to that property are signing, are agreed to and, can, and are signing that contract. Clauses that you typically find in any contract, obviously, is the owner's information, the buyer's information, so you would put all your information on there, the property information. This has to be a legal description, and you can get that at the courthouse. The scope of work, what's going to be performed, and what's going to be performed to comply with this contract, whether I'm going to thin this property, I'm going to clear cut it, I'm going to clean cut it, I'm going to do whatever it takes. That's the scope of the work. How am I going to be paid? A lot of times on a timber deed will be lump sum, which means that you put it up for bid, and then all these people come in there and bid on your property, and you take the highest one, and they pay you for it, and boom, the transaction is over with. Pay as cut means that, that again, we're going to get back to pay as cut, means that every week you're gonna, you should be getting a check from whoever bought that timber. So, but that needs to be laid out in the contract on how you expect to be reimbursed for that. Are there any penalties? Say, for instance, that I've got a year to cut this, but for whatever reason, weather and other business obligations, I can't get that done. Are you going to impose a penalty on me as a logger because I can't get in there by the end of December of this year? So that all has to be laid out. 
And then there are also miscellaneous clauses you can put in there. <coughs> Under scope of work, obviously this is where you want to mention that independent contractor status. Whether, again, whether it's a forester or logger, this is a person who's acting as an independent contractor and is not my employee. That is crucial. Again, under scope work, what are you cutting? Harvest to commence on what date? It could be June 1st of 2013, and we're going to go up to June or May 31st of 2014. That's the completion date. And then clean up BMP work. Who is responsible for that? Some, some timber products companies might just contract with a logger just to, to cut the timber and then have somebody else come in and do the cleanup and BMP work, but that needs to be spelled out. Is the logger you are selling this to or the forester responsible for the cleanup and BMP work? You want that put in. BMP stands for best management practices and we'll get to that in a little bit. Weather delays may, may be declared by whom? So if it's too wet, most of the time, not, again, 99, 99 out of 100 loggers are going to stop on their own when it gets too wet because they just can't afford to work in, that, in those situations. But you need to say, okay, well, if there's going to be a delay, I'm going to be the one responsible for calling that delay. And so you just want to make sure that that relationship needs to be clear inside the contract. Who pays the severance taxes? Because every time you, you sell timber and it gets cut, there's a severance tax involved. And then right to supervise. Who has the right to supervise? Now, this is where some folks get into trouble because they have a forester who's actually responsible for this logging operation, but they're out there all the time dealing with their forester and with the logger. In these situations, you have hired that forester to be your agent. And the only person you have supervisory control over is going to be the forester, not the logger. That means you can't go out there and tell the logger what to do. You have to talk to your forester, and the forester then has to talk to the logger, because that's how those legal arrangements are made. If you're out there and you have a forester who's acting as your agent to cut that timber, and he's going he's to oversee the timber cutting contract. If you go out there and, and tell that logger what to do, you violated that independent contractor status. And it could come back and be bad for you should an accident occur. So you want to make sure that, that, again, we're going back to independent contractor status, which is extremely important. And again, actions trump the clause. So you need, to, you need to make sure that you are acting how that contract says you can act. And so in the case of, uh, in the case of an agent working for me, I, I'm a landowner. I've, hi, I've contracted with a forester to handle this cut for me. That forester then has the right to supervise that logging operation. I don't anymore because I've, I have ceded that through my contract with that forester. Okay, I've ceded those rights to him. He's, at, he's now acting as my agent. And he's the one responsible to make sure that my expectations are met in that logging job now. <coughs> and again, we talked about this, but how do you want to be paid? Lump sum, rate per ton, per thousand, or per cord. Those are just different measurements. Most wood's going to be sold by ton now, unless you get into hardwood or, or uh, some other, other form. But either way, how, however they pay you at the mill is, is, how, is how you want to make sure that, that those rates are reflected in the contract, whether it's per ton, per thousand. MBS stands for 1,000 board feet, and it's just a common measurement we use in forestry, and we call it per 1,000, and then cord. And again, cutting on shares. Again, in the cutting on shares, you want to make sure that you're getting, okay, whether it's 50-50, 60-40, whatever that is, you want to make sure. You can also have penalties in your contract, and these are, these are going to cover more than what we talked about earlier about that, it, you know, going past the deadline. But it's, going to, it's also going to include damage to property. I, if there is excessive damage, and that has to be laid out, I mean, if it's against your will, then you need to find out who's going to pay for that damage. Again, failure to complete on time is, a common, is more common than any of the others, just because of weather conditions. And then overcutting. If the boundaries are not clearly marked, it may fall back on the property owner as to who's responsible for that overcutting. In the state of Mississippi, under law, if you overcut, you can, you can be fined up to triple damages for that. Insurance. This is crucial. Whether you do it or your for whether you're contracting with a logger or your forester is contracting with a logger, you need to have proof of insurance that, that that logger has sufficient liability insurance. And a very common one that a lot of the that a lot of the forest products companies use in this state is a million dollars in general liability. General liability pays that third party harm by something that the logger has done. So that's what's going to cover you. All right. 
And that, that logger, need, and you need to make sure that your forester or you have proof that this logger has at least a million dollars in general liability insurance. There's also a law in Mississippi that states that if I have four or fewer employees, I don't have to pay workers' compensation insurance. But there's nothing wrong with putting in the contract that you want any logger that's on your property to have a workers' compensation policy for their employees. So that's up to you. You, you need to talk this over with your lawyer. And all contracts should be run through your lawyer first. And then any permits. Who's responsible for getting required permits, if any? You know, there, there's not a very, there aren't a whole lot of permits that are required in the state of Mississippi, but some counties may be changing some of that in terms of road permits, and then you just need to figure out who's going to be responsible for that, and that needs to be laid out in the contract. A contract can be as complicated or simple as you're willing to sign, provided it's got those three basic parts, consideration, legal authority, and that agreement. Okay, so you can put what you want to in the contract, and as long as all parties agree to it, everything is fine. And in summary, a good contract protects both parties, and you want a contract only with rep reputable companies. And that's hard to do, but as we talked about logging and forestry being a word-of-mouth business, chances are if your neighbor or another, or another landowner in your county, and you find this out through the County Forestry Association, is happy with a logger or with a forester, chances are you'll be happy too. And, but the same, same holds true. If they're not happy with a logger, they're not happy with the forester, chances are you may not want a contract with them either. The best way to find a logger, and we'll leave this up for a second, the best way to find a logger is by word of mouth, again. And you can go to our website, which is www.loggered.mississippistate.edu slash loggersasp, and in there, you can go to, you can just click on your county, and there are a list of all the loggers that are current in our program. There are certain training requirements they have to go through, and if they're current, they'll show up there, and you can try there. Most loggers, again, most of the walkers, loggers that I work with are excellent. You can do the same thing with foresters. Most foresters who offer their services to the public in this type of, of format are going to be registered foresters. And you can go to that website, www.cfr.msstate.edu slash BORF, which stands for Board of Registration for Foresters, and you can do the same thing. You can click on, you can click on the county and search for all the foresters in that area that offer their services to the public. So there are resources out there, and if you ever find yourself in, in need of further resource, you can contact your county forestry extent or your county extension office or your county forestry commission office. All right, we're going to move in from working with contracts and dealing with that relationship. And again, we're, we're just ju just to recap on that one, communication is key. You need to tell you need to be able to tell the forester or the logger or both what your expectations are for that property. Neither one should be telling you how to deal with your property, okay? It is your land. Do what you want. It doesn't matter what your expectations are. We should be able to, as a forester, we should be able to develop a plan to meet your expectations. And as a logger, we should be able to be able to cut that to meet your expectations. All right. We're going to go back now to best management practices for water quality. And this is, this is a very important thing that, that we're trying to do through all forestry operations in the state of Mississippi. We want to make sure that, that each landowner follows these practices. And the way I like to start this is start with our BMP survey, our latest BMP survey, which was conducted in 2010. And what the Forestry Commission does is, is they will just randomly audit harvesting operations throughout the state. They do a flyover and they pick locations by GPS and they go and visit those sites. And they see how well we're doing. BMPs stand for Best Management Practices, and you append water quality on the end of it because we're really concerned with not polluting the water. And this most recent survey was composed of 237 sites, which covered 80 counties. And their criteria for this was had to be harvested within the past 24 months, greater than 10 acres in size, and it had to be ran randomly selected. When we talk about BMPs, there's a whole bunch of categories that we're concerned with, and these are them. Fire lines, wetlands, landings, site prep, trails and roads, permanent roads, stream crossings, and SMZs. Now, for harvesting operations, fire lines and site prep don't get into it because loggers aren't responsible for fire lines, they're not responsible for site prep. But everything else on that list, loggers are responsible for if they're the ones putting in the BMPs. 
in, in terms of compliance, there's a BMP manual that you can get from the Forestry Commission for free or download it off the website if you want. For overall compliance, we have 90, 93%, and that means they followed all the rec recommendations laid out in the Mississippi BMP manual. And you can see that, that fire lines, wetlands, landings, site prep, permanent roads, crossings, and SMZs are all above 90%, but the low one, 84%, is trails and roads. And there's a couple of reasons for this. This is what the Forestry Commission found when they went out and audited these sites. Sensitive areas were not protected. Now, a sensitive area, in, in, our, in our thinking, a sensitive area would be like a streamside management zone that was not protected adequately. Okay? Skid trails. Skid, skidders are the machines that drag the, drag the trees from the harvested site to the landing. Skid trails on slopes greater than 15 percent. That's really a function of the property more than it is a function of the logging operation, so we're going to kind of ignore that one. Excessive rutting. What the Forestry Commission calls excessive rutting is anything that's deeper than six inches that runs for more than 50 feet. Now, that's not very hard to do with the size of the equipment that loggers use nowadays. The, another one is water control structures not present. This one goes back to the landowners sometimes because a lot of the landowners don't want to put these water control structures in because they want to be able to access their property. And again, this goes back to communication. You need to let the logger know this ahead of time. If you want permanent access to that property, then, then he needs to be able to keep those trails open and we need to protect those in a different way. And then not stabilized is generally a stream crossing or an area that has not been stabilized or left bare. And that's not, all, that's not always the logger's responsibility either because the logger will not typically seed or establish grass on a, on a bare area. So we're going to start with the importance of BMPs, and that's just a little bit of background. Now we're going to get into what they actually are. There are two types of pollution that, are we, that we're concerned with and that we, are, that we want to make sure that we're not committing, as it were, point source and non-point source pollution. Point source is anything that can be tra traced back to a single point, hence the name point source. And you can see from, and you can see from this photo, this goes back to it. That's a storm drainage pipe. That is not an effluent pipe from mill or anything like that going onto that beach. That's a storm drainage pipe. But if a pollutant is in that lake, then they can trace it back to that one point. It's referred to as a point source. Forestry operations, logging operations, are classified as non-point source contributors, which means that this pollution is what comes from overland flow or just normal erosion after a rain event. And this, this is a pretty good example of this in this picture because you can see how the water had found its own course and moved all that dirt down that slope. That would be considered non-point source pollution. There is some confusion, however, when you look at, at a picture like this. You can see that, 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 that the pollution there is going to be sediment. As you can see all the mud in that water. And obviously, that comes from an overland source, but it could be point or non-point source depending on what's on the other side of that culvert. If it's a land clearing operation or they're putting a store in or whatever they're building, it's going to be considered a point source, whereas if it's a harvesting operation on the other side of that, it could be considered a non-point source. We're going to tell you why that's important. It's a political distinction, and this can change. All right? there, there, are, there have been things happening over the past few years that could change this from a non-point source or unregulated form of pollution to a regulated form of pollution which means that you as a landowner would be responsible for getting more permits from the Department of Environmental Quality. That hasn't happened yet, but I'm just telling you that, that, we, that we have a vested interest in keeping forestry operations as a non-point source pollution source, and we can control them best through the use of BMPs. Just some basic points to cover. Obviously, when we're dealing with forestry operations, we do not want to allow surface water runoff to enter a stream, obviously, because the surface water runoff is going to have silt in it or dirt in it or it could be a little bit of oil in it from the, from the log logging operation, whatever it is, that can end up polluting the waterway. You want to maintain the integrity of all stream beds and banks. If through that operation I've done something that's going to weaken the bank of that stream and cause it to fall in, that's going to cause an excessive amount of sedimentation or dirt in the water and cause pollution problems. We don't want to leave any debris of any type in the stream bed. Basically, if, the if during the logging operation, if they have to cross the stream in your property, they may put some trees in there to cross over top of, which is perfectly fine. They can do that. But it all has to come back out at the end of the logging job. 
during this is not going this is not for logging but during your <coughs> your normal operations do not spray chemicals or allow chemicals to degrade surface or groundwater which means that you can't spray chemicals over the stream you want to leave SMZs or streamside management zones on all water courses and these are areas but on, on the side of each stream that protects the water the water quality of that stream and also again this, this last one is not going to be for loggers either but you want to provide for rapid reject rapid revegetation which means we want to plant grass as soon as we can on any bare soil we want to plant grass now just like the contract what we want to do is we want to have some type of written plan that's where communication comes in as well we want to be able to tell you want to be able to tell the loggers what you expect out of the out of that harvest in terms of water quality management and BMPs so any kind of water any kind of harvest plan is going to be almost like the contract we have the name the location the map a map is essential you want a good map of your property where the boundaries are where the waters are if there are streams what things need protecting etc but also what we want to do is we want to list existing pollution problems if there's an existing pollution problem on that property then you can't hold the, the logger responsible for it and that needs to be cleaned up ahead of time but also in this water quality plan and harvest plan what kind of BMPs do I want to use first of all I want to use BMPs second which ones can I use if I want to leave that road open then I'm going to use a different type of water diversion structure than I would if I'm going to close that road these are three key areas for BMPs roads and trails stream crossings and streamside management zones and we're going to go over what each one of these entails so the first is roads and trails things to consider for roads and trails so, so when a logger or forester comes up and says we want to use BMPs this is what they're going to look at the location and grade of your property or the location and grade of the road excuse me the location and grade of the road what kind of water diversion structures you want to put on there again if, if I'm going to leave that road open I'm going to use a different one than I would if I'm going to close that road meaning no traffic is going to be on there and do I have to cross a stream hopefully we don't have to cross any streams but sometimes you may have to this photo is obviously an aerial photo and all those dark areas in the center are what we call a streamside management zone there's a stream that runs through the center of those and we've left all of that all those trees there and the understory to help filter the water that comes from runoff and you can see that by the the lighter areas on there that those the roads are all stay on the ridge tops each one of those little lines of, of the dark green is a ravine and we've left the we left the trees in those ravines and on the, and the light areas where the roads are that's the, those are the hilltops and it really doesn't matter if you have a one or two foot change of elevation on your property and that's it if you're in flatland you still have these types of terrain features and we want to go for the highest ground possible for these roads <coughs> this is a good example of a permanent road now I need to preface this by saying loggers don't build permanent roads if you want a permanent road on your property that's going to be up to you loggers are not equipped to build these kinds of roads but they can use these kinds of roads if they're already existing and improve them or fix them after they get done but what's good about this road is it's crowned up it's got gravel on it and you can see on each side it's got ditches and and you can see where that those ditches kind of turn off into the woods and that's what we want the water hits the road and, and rolls off the side into those ditches goes downhill into the turnouts and water gets spread out into vegetation which is which is very important that keeps your road dry it keeps the streams clean and everything else is working properly with that road this is more in line with what a logger would build in terms of a temporary road it's not going to be built up like a permanent road is they're just going to do a couple of passes on there with the bulldozer just just to be able to get their trucks in there to the landing so they can get get the material out and once that road once that logging job is done they're going to button that road up or close it up and they're going to put water bars and turnouts and stuff like that and then they're just, it's going to look like there was never a road there this is a skid trail obviously <coughs> and you can see that that, it, that they skid they use a skid trail when it was wet so it's got a little holes in it but that's not a big deal there's no stream close to there and that's all right but we can close those up too and when that logging job is done we can put water bars and turnouts on that as well the key to any decent water control or water diversion structure is to move the water off the road and into vegetation when water when erosion happens water from rain will collect and as it moves over exposed soil it picks up those dirt particles 
and it turns brown, just like that first picture that we saw. And then it, if, I, if I channel that water into vegetation, the vegetation does two things. It slows that water down, and what that allows is that it, as that water slows down, those heavy particles filter out of it and hit the ground. It also disperses the water. And so as it hits that vegetation, it's going to disperse it and slow it down. If I've got a channel running, then, it's gonna, it, then, then nothing can clean that water. But if I disperse it and I slow it down, then all those solids are going to settle out of it before it reaches the stream. And an another portion is to stabilize the soil. And what a lot of loggers do now, what a lot of foresters recommend, is slash dispersal. What, and by slash we mean the tops and the limbs that aren't going to be used, that aren't going to be sold to the mill, pile up at the landing. And they're going to pick those up and take them out and put them on their skid trail. And if they drive on top of this slash, it's going to move that slash deeper into the soil and it's going to stabilize it. And you won't have erosion problems. So the first thing we want to talk about are turnouts. And turnouts are simply ditches on the side of the road, like in this photograph here. And we talked about this with the permanent road. It's just a ditch that kind of moves off into vegetation. And so the water is going to hit that ditch, get channeled off to the right there, and go into trees and undergrowth, which is where you want it to go. The most common mistake you see with a turnout, though, is a dam at the end, or it's just built up. And so when that water hits that turnout, if there's nowhere for it to go, it's going to back up onto your road, and it's going to double the amount of water going down to your next water diversion structure. And this is crucial because each one of these structures, structures is designed to hold or to take care of only a certain amount of water. And if I double the amount of water going to the next one, then the chances of me blowing that one out are, have, have, have increased, and we could cause a domino effect problem. Another method are water bars, is what everybody's probably m most familiar with. And this is just a mound of soil built at an angle across the road. And what happens is when water's running down that road, it's going to hit that water bar, move off to the right, and it's going to go off into vegetation. <laughs> the most common problem that I see with, with water bars is that it's only built as wide as the trail is. And so it's going to do, do the same thing. When water's coming down this trail, it's going to hit that water bar and go off to the right again. But once it reaches that red line, it's just going to skirt right around it and get right back on the road. And so again, we're, we're doubling the amount of water going to the next water diversion structure. Water bar spacing. There are a lot of recommendations in the BMP manual for spacing. And probably the best way that you can think about it is to wherever I'm standing on that road and looking straight ahead, where my eyes cross that trailer road again, that's where the next water diversion structure goes. So every five, six foot change in elevation where you want these. And this is a good example in this picture here of how frequently you have to put them in given the slope of the soil. Slash dispersal. This is probably the best way to control erosion on trails especially. Because again, if we lay that slash down and drive over top of it, like in this picture here, that's a cut the length system, something we don't see too much around here, but this, it's ideal for this situation. If we're driving over top of that, we're never exposing the mineral soil. If we don't expose the mineral soil, then there's nothing that, the, that, that, the, that a rain event can do to pick that mineral soil up and cause erosion. So the more we can drive on top of it, the better off we're going to be. And that's just a, that's, that's more of a typical example in a pine thinning there. You can see, and it's, it's flat, so it doesn't need too many water diversion structures, but you can see that skidder picked up all the limbs and top at the landing and distributed them back out as he's driving back. The skidder's got to go back and get the wood anyway, so you may as well have him deliver some of those tops and, and branches out there, and then he can drive over top of those. And you're protecting the, the exposed mineral soil there as well. Stream crossing. Obviously, we want to avoid stream crossings if we can, but if we have to, we can do it well. This is an example of what a stream crossing should look like a few months, six months after a logging job. The, stream, the, the channel is clear, the water is clear, and all that grass has been established, so it's holding that soil in place. W once you plant the grass and it gets established, that root system is going to do more to keep that soil in place than any other water diversion structure you can put on that property. And you can see there on the end that, that the decaying straw bales there, they even staked that out, and they just put them on there and they drove them in the ground with wooden stakes to help protect that stream further until that grass got established. Streamside management zones. 
Now, according to SMZs, they're required on perennial streams and intermittent streams, or basically both stream types. On perennial streams, we need ground cover and an overstory, which means that we cannot cut 100% of the trees out from your perennial stream bed. And then, and, and a lot of loggers tell me that this is, a, this is one of the largest problems they have with landowners today, is that, that landowners don't, don't understand that they really aren't supposed to cut all the way to the stream bank, cut all your trees. We can take about half of them, but we can't cut all of them. Intermittent streams are streams that only run part of the year. And you can leave ground cover only during the dry period. But if there's water in that stream, when the operation happens, they're going to treat it as a perennial stream and leave some of the overstory or some of the taller trees. SMZs act as vegetative buffers. And again, what, we, what that does, it disperses the water and it reduces the speed of runoff. And the slower that water goes, the more that sediment's going to drop right out of it. But you also maintain current water temperature and act as wildlife corridors and really improve the aesthetic look of the harvest. It, se it serves several purposes. And this is just an example. You can see from the three sections harvested there that if all of that was gone, it would look a whole lot different. But they've left these SMZs along there. And that, they act as wildlife corridors, they help with the water quality, and they do a whole lot of beneficial things to the harvest. And you haven't lost a whole lot by leaving those trees there. You can harvest in your SMZ, but it's going to depend on the season, the soil type, the slope, the equipment, and the land use. All right. By the season, we, if it's dry and they can get that equipment in there, straight in and straight back out of that SMZ, you can go ahead and take 50% of the crown cover. We call the crown cover. <coughs> but, it's all, but if there's an erosion problem or if that person tries to get in there and run up and down the SMZ and harvest, then we don't want that because that destroys the undergrowth. The undergrowth does most of the work. The large trees there are going to provide shade to that water, which is also important, but the sediment is stopped by that undergrowth. As long as that undergrowth is intact, you can get in there and harvest half of the, basically half the volume that's there. And obviously, the steeper the land is, the closer to the stream, the wider the SMZ has to be, because obviously, because the water is going to be running faster on steeper slopes. So you need a larger area for it to disperse and slow down in before it reaches the stream. Water is getting to the stream one way or the other, whether it's above ground or underground. But above ground, it's going to get there one way or the other, and we want to make it as clean as possible before it hits the, hits the stream. And so percent slope is, is another forestry term that we use, and, and it's basically rise over run. So if I'm 100 feet out and 100 feet up in the air, at the 45 degree angle, that's 100 percent slope. So a 5% slope is pretty shallow, and so we, but we require a 30-foot SMZ width on that, and it goes up from there. Anything over 40% is going to require at least a 60-foot wide strip on either side of the stream, from the bank out. And again, we want to use a judgment for increasing width depending on terrain, and also soil type. A lot of folks ask us to go out there and tell us what, you know, what's going to happen, but we're not that sure what's going to happen because we're not that familiar with the soil type. You who've been on that property your entire lives know exactly what that soil is going to do in the event of a rain. So if you think it needs to be wider, go ahead and make it wider. Everything in the BMP manual are minimum requirements. And the minimum should be met. And anything beyond that, if you want to make, if you want to make it a 40 foot or an 80 foot or a 100 foot SMZ, that's fine with us. But it shouldn't be any thinner than 30 feet. Wetlands. We're going to cover this real quick. I'm not sure how many of y'all have wetlands, but <coughs> the thing about wetlands is these are federally regulated and these are mandatory BMPs that you must do whether you want to or not. The big thing about it is land use cannot be changed without a permit from the Corps of Engineers. Wetlands fall under what we call jurisdictional wetlands, which means that the actually the United States Army Corps of Engineers has jurisdiction over the wetland even though you may own it. They're going to have to tell you what you know, that th you're going to have to follow the BMPs that they recommend and also get permits required if you want to change the land use. And in this instance, SMZs are required on all water bodies regardless. And I think they're 35 feet. But again, if you own a wetland area, chances are it could be regulated by the Corps of Engineers. And if you want to change that land use, now pine trees to pine trees is fine. Hardwood to hardwood is normally fine. But if you, if, if you want to go from pine trees to pasture, you may want to consider asking somebody and maybe getting a permit because that, that falls into federally regulated and that's a whole other ballgame. 
Now I realize I covered all these, a lot of these BMPs very fast, and, and, and one, of the, one of the downsides of this video format is that I don't get to answer questions directly. But if you have any questions, you can contact your county extension office, you can contact your county forestry commission office, and, and uh, you can download a copy of the BMP manual there. But, uh, and, and they, for all intents and purposes, for landowners, BMPs are voluntary. You can put them in or not put them in depending. But BMPs are the best way we have to protect, to protect water quality and to abide by the Clean Water Act. So if you don't put any BMPs in and you end up polluting the water, you're going to get fined by the DEQ. If you put all the BMPs in and you still pollute the water, you're probably not going to get fined because you did everything possible to protect your water quality. But even though BMPs are, are voluntary, you're still responsible for compliance with the Clean Water Act. And most loggers now, because they're in the PLM program and they work for mills that are certified according to Sustainable Forestry Initiative, for, they're going to have to put BMPs in regardless. And so we want to get you used to the idea of using them. That they're, they're not that detrimental to you. They're going to protect your water quality, and you're not going to lose that much income from your SMZs and stuff like that. So if you have any questions, you can contact us. Please call us. We'll be happy to help you out. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much.